I really like this idea. I found it very satisfying that there's like a few fundamental principles that can apply to many situations. That you know, there's like some handful of equations I know going in, and then I have like the fundamental rules that when I go on the test, there's an infinite number of possible questions, but it's just how do I put these things together to answer any of these real situations? You know, I, I had this idea of computational physics, and I think I had this fantasy that if I could master physics and master programming, I would be like a wizard. It would just be, there's gonna be some fundamental principles I'll learn, I'll get practice on how to choose the right ones and put them together, and I'll be so good at programming, I can automate all the tedious bits, and I'll just be able to answer any question that I'm interested in. And then when it came time to go to grad school and sort of pick an advisor, I had this idea of doing still computational physics, and the idea of these first principles calculations still appealed to that wanting to be a wizard. It was this, um, we're really starting with the basic, some basic rules, and you give me an arrangement of atoms. In principle, I can tell you what it does. A lot of my PhD work was in this first principles approach where I'm taking this arrangement of atoms, using the machinery of density functional theory that maps things onto a non-interacting problem, and either applying that and or form, find, coming up with models for systems like super lattices, where maybe I you have two systems that are stacked together like Legos, and, and one project was do a bunch of calculations for one of those layers. Um, for each constituent material, each Lego brick, and be able to say what happens when you stack these Legos together. Another project involved how to compute a particular property more efficiently, and that was how to compute changes in electric polarization in a ferroelectric. And the real key was sort of using more information from the, even just this approximate wave function than was typically done for previous calculations, and that solved a lot of ambiguities that existed. So I guess it led to my position at CCQ and, what, and sort of some of the things I'm doing now. Um, and I'd say they're both related in some way. Uh, you know, both of those projects are related to several of my projects now, um, even though they at first may seem to be quite different. So one of my projects now is taking this density functional theory machinery and including not just electrons and in some sense nuclei into it, but also including photons, so light is as a you know, fully quantum mechanical particle and, and how that can affect uh, systems. That's kind of related to some of this polarization work in that the main way photons couple to matter is actually through the polarization of the system. That that's sort of in the, in the equation for the energy where the photon uh, variable and the matter variable connect is through the matter's uh, polarization. Another project that I'm, I'm working on at CCQ involves how vibrations in materials are affected by the magnetism in the material in ways that have been somewhat neglected. The term that captures this effect is actually related to these changes in phases of the wave function, which was some of the techniques in a different context I used for this computing changes in polarization of a ferroelectric. So there's, even though it's a very different effect, there's a very mathematically similar aspect of it where there's these phases on your wave functions that you're using in a different context to um, obtain a um, quantity of interest. The ultimate goal in this area of research of quantum materials and such is, um, you know, well, there's really a few goals. One, we have some kind of machinery that to an extent can say when there's this set of atoms arranged roughly in this way, what does it do? The next goal is saying, can we use these kind of tools to answer why questions? You know, okay, is it, I can do an experiment where I put these atoms together and then make this measurement, but I don't necessarily have a feeling for, you know, why this is how it came out. You know, it could help with a third goal, a really ambitious goal that says, I want a material that has these properties what atoms do I put together and how? So the reason it's so hard to say, like, predict how this set of atoms is going to act is because it's really governed by quantum mechanics. And while we can write down uh, what is like the many-body Schrodinger equation, that's in principle the equation that has all the information. If we can solve this equation, we, we know exactly, all, we can in principle predict all of these properties. But the solutions to this equation are come in the form of these uh, many-body wave functions, which are very complex objects. Um, you know, they require a lot of information just to even write down the answer if you already had it. We approach this impossibly hard problem by uh, solving a simpler problem, 
One direction is just coming up with a toy model, something you think you have a better sense of how, knowing how to solve. Another approach is, say, I still want to start with this full, this idea that's very connected to these atoms in these locations, but I'm going to make certain approximations that you know, maybe neglect some interactions so I can get an effective theory that I can then solve. You know, a lot of work now is actually tying those two things back together, where maybe you, you have some effect in your toy model that you can solve, but you want to now connect it to the actual atoms. So then you do this first principles approximation, where you make these approximations to get some result that way, but you use that to give you the parameters of your toy model, and then you can really have a better chance at capturing all the complicated physics that you can't do really with atoms, um, but still have it connected to that physical picture. So what properties do we want? Well, okay, everyone wants a high temperature superconductor. So in principle, the non-interacting wave function itself won't get you there, but it might have the right ingredients to go into a model that treats the physics that will get you there. So that's the really ambitious goal. In actual projects I've worked on, I'm, um, you know, in a very practical, real sense, it's been this uh, properties of ferroelectrics, how much they, how their polarization changes, um, dielectric permittivity, basically how much does a system respond to an electric field? Um, you know, in particular, this super lattice project that I mentioned where we have these Legos, we found that certain layerings make it react more strongly to the presence of an electric field, which is useful in various devices and computers and things. This magnetic interaction with vibrations in a system you know, could be used as some sort of sensor maybe, but it also is a really fundamental interaction that can be used for sort of an infinite number of things, uh, potentially. It could you know, combine with something else and, and really give effects that are even hard to say at this, at this first level. One, I think I had this uh, ambition to automate everything way too soon, um, or try to make things way too general. Or, but it really, there's some balance to be struck there, and I think I've gotten a little better at that. Um, I'm still improving there. I also kind of, a change in sort of discipline or approach is just that I think I once valued like the novel idea is the most important thing. And I think over time, I'm starting to value that, you know, a lot of times once you have a good idea or a solution to a complex problem, actually grinding it out and following through on it is, is almost more valuable. I'm starting to value that more than just coming up with ideas itself. Sort of ideas can be generated very rapidly, but following through on them takes some grit.